So I think critical thinking is a huge aspect of the ER. And it's mainly, I would say it's mainly that. And then you do start IVs, you do do the drips, you do medications, splinting, reductions of bones or dislocations, conscious sedations for like people that have different rhythms, like heart rhythms that need to be cardioverted. We do everything. Oh, I go. hey. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. Hey. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Hey. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid on my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses show. Here with your hosts, Peter and Matt, two nurses on a mission to change this world, one conversation at a time. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. If you find value in the show, please share and review the show. It would mean absolutely everything to us. Cupinurses.com for the latest info, updates, show notes, and what we're up to. For our lifestyle podcast, you can check out wearefrontlinewarriors.com. In this episode, we would like to introduce you to Stephanie Beggs. Stephanie is a content creator, Forbes 30 Under 30, and emergency room nurse. She unintentionally became viral on social media for her quick, concise educational tools that led to the creation of RN Explained. Our main focus today was ER nursing and crazy patient experiences. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here. Thank you so much for your time. Can you give us a little bit of a back about yourself of why you got into nursing and where you are today? Yes, um, I got into nursing as a second degree. Mm -hmm. I have a prior degree. Um, so I didn't go into nursing or even thought that I was going to go into nursing until way later in life. Um, my first degree is business marketing. And then I decided that after I got that degree and worked at Warner brothers for a little bit, it was not what I wanted to do. So I went back to school to do nursing. So in terms of ER, why I chose ER specifically, um, Prior to nursing school, I had to get some type of experience in the medical field. Coming from business, I had no experience in, in medicine at all. So I decided to be a medical scribe for, um, it's like an ER-based urgent care here in LA. And so that really exposed me to lo a lot of um, ER doctors, PAs, NPs, stuff like that, and, and ER medical conditions. And that's kind of what sparked my interest really into ER specifically and why I went that route. Um, I also love everything gory and gross and trauma, like trauma, traumatic, like everything like that. So that also kind of geared me towards ER. And then in terms of my business, very unintentional. Um, I was studying for the board's exam during COVID. I had nobody to study with, kind of... Um, filmed myself, put those videos on social media, and then everybody loved them. So I kept making them, went viral, and then made a business out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know business and nursing are two completely different fields. What got you inspired yes. into taking care of people and being in healthcare? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, I always wanted to go into nursing. Mm -hmm. I, picking business for me was kind of my whole family are entrepreneurs. They're all in the business field. So picking business for me was kind of just all I really knew. I had growing up, I had always loved medicine and um, anatomy and physiology and stuff like that. So had I had gotten to choose something else besides business coming out of high school, I would have chosen to go the medical nursing route. Mm. Um, other than that, I would say what kind of further confirmed my like love for nursing was when I, uh, I took care of my mom when she had stage four cancer. And that was when I was in nursing school. Um, so I had already chosen the nursing route by that time, but she definitely confirmed that like, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Mm. So. Yeah. And it looks, and it looks like both of those degrees paid off, you know, you're, yeah. you are, you're RN and you're also doing a lot of stuff in business. So it's like you got exactly. a pretty much like a two for one deal. You you learn both sides of the, yeah. the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I uh, I t always tell people I have never used my business degree more until I got into nursing. So, yeah. just so interesting. That's awesome. And then for your ER experience, is it just through the urgent care, or did you work at like trauma hospitals? Uh, how, how is that? Yeah. So prior to nursing school, my first ever exposure was as a medical scribe. Then I went to nursing school. I did that whole thing. 
now I'm an ER nurse. Um, I have the first job and subsequent jobs after that. Um, I have only worked in the ER as an ER nurse. Mm. So, yeah. And uh, we want to address the elephant in the room because Peter and I are both ICU nurses and you work in the ER. Sometimes <laughs> the ER and the ICU has beef or sometimes we just kind of bump heads about how things yes. should be because we have two completely different specialties. Do you ever encounter those uh, situations? All the time, every day. <laughs> um, taking, I would say, taking any patient to the ICU, there's always something we do wrong. <laughs> um but I mean, I learned, I take it with a grain of salt because I feel like with any unit that we as ER nurses take our patients to, there's always something that's going to be wrong. Um, there's always something somebody complains about, but it's okay. I feel like that's just like people's differences in the way they like carry out their nursing duties, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, I think there's forever going to be a beef between ICU and <laughs> ER. It's it just uh, completely two different specialties where you're just trying to stabilize to make sure they're just getting out of this damn ER versus us. We're changing, addressing, and finding exactly how many centimeters that central line is on that, you know, on the right right subclavian. So oh, we're yeah. just very, very detail-oriented, which causes oh, us to 100%. bump heads. Yeah, you guys are, you guys are for sure detail-oriented and um, very meticulous, like about your, your drips and your lines and stuff like that, which is awesome. And I get a little taste of that. We hold a lot of patients in the ER because we're so full and the hospital is so full that we hold a lot of ICU patients. So sometimes I, you know, have one-to-one -one with an ICU in the ER for my whole shift or sometimes two or three shifts in a row. Um, so I get a little taste, which I actually don't mind ICU sometimes, mm. um, because, the patients are so critical, and I love that. So, would you ever consider switching from ER to uh, to ICU? No, no? Okay. no. I like it for like one shift in a in a long time, but no, <laughs> just because I like the I like the ambulance runs. I like you know, um, the traumas that we see. You guys do get you know patients that crash and code and stuff like that, which I like too. But I think I I like the ambulance runs and I like the traumas and stuff like that. Mm. And Stephanie, can you give us like a insight to like your shift activities of an ER nurse? What do you do like when you come on or what's yeah. like the kind of like maybe some protocols that, that you have or just like the workflow? Yes. So let's see. I have worked day shift and night shift. Mm -hmm. I think that both day shift and night shift are completely different in the way that the day or the, the shift runs. Um, so, for example, if I was on day shift and I we would get our assignments, I go out there and it's usually like a lull at the beginning of day shifts. I feel like you kind of start not, I don't want to say like slow, but you start like slower, I guess. And then it picks up around like 10 or 11 ish. And then it's like guns a blazing for the rest of the shift. Um, yeah, we have in the ER, it's four to one. So four patients to one nurse. Um, and then you also try to help out. Like if a trauma comes in, I'll jump into the trauma as well or something. But yeah, so it's usually like a lull and then it's like very busy. Or if I'm night shift, when you get onto the floor on night shift, it is like chaos, um, complete chaos. It doesn't stop until probably I would say two or three in the morning. And then you get the couple hours of the lull and then it kind of picks back up when people start to wake up. Mm. So so as like an e, as like an ER nurse, uh, what are your responsibilities? Just like starting people on drips, uh, like starting I IVs. Is there a certain oh, expectation yeah, when somebody all. comes in, you got to handle these things first? Um, we do it all. So I think that like one of the most important things in ER specifically is to critically think, especially when you see you are the first person that the patient is seeing. So uh, you have to take what these patients are saying and the signs and symptoms and the clinical presentation that you're given and kind of make, you know, these thoughts in your head or these decisions in your head of what you're going to do first, second, third, what's most important, what you can wait on, what you should tell the doctor and stuff like that. Um, so I think critical thinking is a huge aspect of the ER. Um, yeah. And it, it's mainly, I would say it's mainly that. And then you do start IVs, you do do the drips, you do medications, splinting, uh, reductions of bones or dislocations 
uh, conscious sedations for like people that have different rhythms, like heart rhythms mm. that need to be cardioverted. We do everything yeah. codes. Yeah. How, how does the specialties like differ as far as like in the ER? Does everybody take pediatric patients? Is there specific nurses that are divided? Somebody no. has the trauma bay, for example, how does all those dynamics work? Uh, it's kind of on a rotation. There's no actual like piece of paper where you rotate like through these, but as a, ch like as a charge nurse, they kind of know, okay, you had the psych patients yesterday. I'm not going to give you the psych patients again for like a couple days or weeks or whatever. Um, but they do rotate us. Yeah. Like at a couple of the hospitals that I've been at, there is a day, there is a room where it is all psych patients. So if you're the nurse that's assigned to those rooms, you are technically a psych nurse for that shift. Um, that is the only one I would say that's rotated actively because it's really hard to um, be a psych nurse for 12 hours. So uh, that one is rotated a lot. Other than that, you can get in any other assignment, you can get any type of patient. So pediatrics, geriatrics, anybody else traumas no traumas yeah what's like the craziest thing you've maybe seen trauma wise or psych wise like for example for me the two craziest things i probably see in my whole nursing career is a patient that had well, that was post open heart and he said an open chest and he coded where he had to do like a cardiac massage and then a second one yeah. that i've seen was compartment syndrome in a calf where they end up getting a, like a fasciotomy and that was super super bloody both very uh, traumatic things, things to see in, in a patient. So I'm curious if, have you seen anything crazy? Yes, I have seen many, many things crazy. I think the first one that comes to mind was a patient that was airlifted, um, to us from, it was a skier versus mm. snowboarder mm. accident. And I'm assuming that the patient they airlifted to us was the skier because injuries with the snowboard, I think are more traumatic than ones with the ski. So I'm assuming this was the patient that was a skier that got hit by the snowboarder. Mm. Um, and they came in airlifted. They had a T1 to T3 fracture, a ru uh, ruptured aorta. Um, they oh. had coded twice on the mountain Damn. and then ended up getting the patient back, um, intubated them, gave them six liters of blood, like I think like three units of plasma, or six units of blood, three units of plasma, and then sent them over mm. to us. Insane. It was actually insane. Um, once the patient was stabilized in our ER, it was obviously sent to ICU. So I have no idea if the patient survived mm. or left or not, but that one was absolutely wild. Yeah, that's wild. Like some of the ER cases that, that, I, that I've heard that people have told me about is like the most ex most unexpected stuff. Like you usually think of like a motor vehicle accident as being traumatic, but usually like the like the more out of the box stuff, like you said, the snowboarder versus, versus skier snowboarder being, versus being super skier. traumatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We also see a lot of, um, super shockingly, a lot of like pedestrian auto, like auto pedestrian accidents or motorcycle like auto accidents too, mm. um, which are very common. Like we get that probably on the daily in the ER. Yeah. Another crazy thing that comes to mind is when I did um, trauma over, over in Illinois, we had somebody that came in with like five or six gunshots and he basically um, was not able, wasn't able, able to move. I'm not sure if it like nicked his spinal, spinal column somewhere or just, or just he got like a, um, like a brain injury where he lost oxygen. But it was crazy because he had a bunch of, bunch of bullet holes in him and he never, and he hasn't moved since. And, and he had like the anoxic brain injury. And then mm -hmm. and during our shift, he like, for some reason lifted his arms and legs. And then like a couple hours later, he coded and he ended up passing away. So that, that was like a pretty, pretty crazy insane. moment. It wasn't super traumatic because yeah. we already had him after he, he already had like, you know, the, the surgery bullets were taken out, but just like seeing somebody to like move out of like yes. nowhere as pronounced that like he can't, he can't move. And then a couple hours coding and passing away. That was like one of like the most like yeah. insane moments I've ever seen. Yeah. I think the craziest ones too are the, another one that also comes to mind is a um, lady who actually ended up being my patient for multiple days. Um, but she had come in from getting a, she was getting like a plasma transfusion, I think at home. She mm -hmm. had like a home health nurse. And this was like a young lady, like very 
healthy. I don't know why she was getting the plasma transfusion, but for some reason, the nurse at home decided to call 911 to send her to the ER because she had slightly complained of shortness of breath, but that was it. Like she was talking fine. Vitals were fine. Everything was completely fine when she had gotten to the ER and for up for like a couple hours of her stay in the ER, she was stable, very stable. And then all of a sudden, I don't, it was maybe a late onset re reaction, like transfusion reaction or something where she completely tanked, completely tanked. Like her blood pressure was in the sixties. Her oxygen was in the seventies and she was hallucinating. And we were like, whoa, where did this come from? Because all of her vitals were completely normal. And then it was like here, it was like up. And then it just like completely tanked. And, um, yeah, I have never had to fight for someone to be intubated more in my life than with that mm. patient and mm -hmm. getting the doctor to take me seriously of like, we need to intubate this patient. They're crashing. Um, luckily they survived, but that one was crazy too. Mm. Just seeing someone so stable and then seeing them so not was wild. I'm, I'm curious because nursing is a high adrenaline career and everything. So sometimes we as nurses get tired, want to transition, potentially switch careers. And I know you are into being a social media influencer, everything in your career. Have you ever yeah. thought about nursing being your second career or jumping to part-time? Do you think that because nursing is your second career you're going to stick out with it? Yeah, I thought about that a lot, actually. Um, my In my ideal world, what gives me the most income right now is my business, R Unexplained. So um, staying at the bedside is really my choice. I don't have to because um, I have a better income somewhere else, but I genuinely love being at the bedside and helping actual real people like in the hospital who are really sick. Um, I love that. So I have not wanted to leave that. My ideal world, I would love to do per diem. Mm. If I didn't do per diem, I actually did travel nursing for a little bit. And I liked that because I had a certain amount of time that I'd be working. And then I could, I knew I was going to have time off that I could dedicate to my business. Um, yeah. So I would love to do one of those. Or honestly, I would do, I was looking at possibly doing like flight nursing or something, which is different hours, a different type of lifestyle than bedside. Yeah. It seems like you like a lot of that adrenaline rushing stuff. So what do you do outside of like your, your business outside of nursing? Do you also do like some crazy stuff like skydiving or paragliding or anything else that kind of pumps <laughs> no, adrenaline up? Or do you get rid of that in the hospital? I get rid of it in the hospital, okay. honestly. I I would love to go sky, skydiving. I've never actually been skydiving before, but um, I'm a big adrenaline junkie, so I would love to do that stuff. I just haven't found the time to actually do it because I'm so busy, but it'd be great. Mm. And then you mentioned Arn Explain. Can you give us a little bit about that, how you guys started into it, uh, some of your goals? Yeah. Yeah, so um started the business uh back in 2020 when right during covid when i was studying for the boards i started the business to kind of really help myself um study for the boards which ended up helping like everybody around the world too it got so big people wanted to buy my study sheets and so i created a business selling my study sheets so that's what i do now i teach on social media as well on many different platforms but um yeah so i do that Pretty much any time that I'm not in the ER, I live and breathe are unexplained. Mm. How has your life changed as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a influencer? Um, you know, I would say it's actually a lot of pressure mm. more than it's a lot of. OK, I say it's a lot of satisfaction and gratification because seeing the DMs or the responses or the comments from people about how much I have impacted their journey as a student or a new grad, that is so satisfying. Um, but then on the other side, it's a lot of pressure because uh, people do really look towards me for advice, for knowledge, for teaching, for anything. And yeah, I just want to make sure that what I'm putting out there is accurate, factual, interesting, um, you know, helpful. And yeah, so it's pressure, but it's good pressure, mm -hmm. I would say. 
How do, how do you create your work-life balance around those two passions that you have with your side business, side hustle, and being a full-time nurse? Because I know sometimes we have like these expectations that we give ourselves that are just made up out of pure imagination. Like I need to record these five videos and you create so much pressure yeah. where, you know, you're struggling with work-life balance between being a, you know, uh, influencer and work in the ER. So how do you maintain uh, those two? Yeah, I would, um, you know, I actually fall into that more often than not. I fall into pressuring myself to set, I, I set these deadlines or I set these standards and then I put more pressure on myself that needs that doesn't even need to be there. So I fall into that um, sometimes. And I'm trying to work on that by kind of creating a schedule for the month, like ahead of time to know weeks or even days in advance of what I should be doing um, in terms of content creation. But I think the best part is it almost comes effortless to me to think of the like content that I want to put out there because my ER life and my business kind of go hand in hand. And I love to show people that what I'm teaching and studying and content creating on is seen in real life as a nurse. And I can show you that. Um, so yeah, so I think sometimes I get pretty stressed out because I'm just so busy, but I, I like it and it's not too hard to think of the content that I want because I know what I'm seeing in real life and I want to teach people about that. Mm -hmm. And you, and you said how both of those worlds are connected because you are oh, yeah. an ER nurse living or working, I should say. One thing that comes to mind is there's always, always a policy about social media. You can't be doing this and that. Have you ever had issues where you ran into a backlash from an employer where you had to kind of set a boundary for always. yourself and record? Mm. Always. I think one of the biggest things that needs to be changed in the world is uh, HR. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think they're outdated and they sometimes don't even have any medical background that I have had a lot of run-ins with HR just because they simply don't understand that I'm not a threat. My uh, influence in social media is not, should not be taken as a threat to the hospital, but rather they should take it as a benefit or even um, like advertisements mm -hmm. for their hospital, you know? And a lot of the times HR doesn't recognize that they could be using influencers like myself who boast about working at, you know, working in the ER or whatever, and use that to their advantage to get more nurses to come in. Um, but instead they think it's a threat. So Yes, I've had many, many conversations, I would say, with HR. And but I also like to preface with any hospital that I go to, I'm very transparent about what I do in my business. So they know upon hire, this is what I do. This is I content create. This is, you know, I teach people around the world. I'm I show them things come full circle and whatnot. Um, so they know ahead of time. Mm. Yeah, and you bring up a, a good point. It would be a good way for hospitals to like advertise their, like, because right now every time you hear about a hospital on the news or about nurses, it's always something bad. Like this hospital is doing mm -hmm. this wrong, you know, and it kind of like pushes yeah. nurses away from the bedside because they just, and even future nurses, like if they see like nurses doing see these 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 news captions that are saying, oh, another protest, another this. It's always negative, but imagine it, like mm -hmm. hospital promoting like being happy about their core nurse staff because they have. Um, low, low leaving rates, they have a good environment to work in, like they should figure out a way to promote that because nurses are leaving leaving the bedside and you want to be able to have your hospital, your, your unit seem like a ideal place for, for a nurse to work. There's nothing, there's no push, really? pushing, pushing that aspect. It's basically like everything that you hear is just negative, negative, negative. But if like a hospital will push something positive, like, hey, we have retention rates are, 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 are very good for this hospital because we provide this on the unit, we provide growth opportunity, provide that. You never really hear about that. And that could be another sales never. thing that hospitals could do to retain more staff and bring on you know, new grads or healthcare professionals in general. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, I would say peop, it, HR, like the people in the hospital that are making these decisions of you know who works there and whatnot, um, they don't give these influencers i would say um they don't give influencers you know a shot to kind of even see the content that they're putting out there they just automatically think oh no we don't want to associate ourselves with somebody who has this much reach because 
the potential of what they could do, you know, to, to our hospital type of thing. Um, but instead, like there are so many influencers out there and so many friends that I have just around the world that have had this same issue um, with HR all over, like all over America. And um, never and none of them talk anything bad about their job. It's always positive, um, always how much they love their job, what they do a day in the life. And people love to see that the, the world outside of medicine loves to see that. And they're failing to recognize that mm. kind of, um, yeah. And so they could be using that to their advantage to kind of show, you know, how their hospital works or how it's run or how the ER, you know, runs and why it's so busy and stuff like that. But they don't, they don't want to interact with us. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the idea how you could bring marketing into absolutely staff nursing yeah. essentially. But I see the other side of the hospitals where I feel like because of HIPAA and everything that happens in our work, suing policies, all these things, everything's hush yeah. as, as a healthcare professional. And we're supposed to just shut our lips about everything. We can't communicate it and bring up any subjects, yeah. which, uh, you know, which makes it difficult. And sometimes on the, on the contrary, there's also people, let's just call them haters. Right. And they mm -hmm. don't want to see succeed maybe in the workplace and they try to bring you down. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, Peter and I had this situation. We did a contract actually in LA and, um, I, 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 uh, Peter was in a different unit. I'm like, hey, Pete, send me some eye drops. So Peter sent me some eye drops through the tube station, but it was like a joke <laughs> where he he uh, taped yeah. it up to a pier wick. And, <laughs> you know, it's funny. We're not sharing any any confidential inf information with patients. That was just, hey, this is just a funny picture. And somebody that works there thinks that we're just having too much fun. Night shift is lazy, yeah, which already creates the drama between uh between shifts and it's like okay guys you're the middleman you can't be doing this stuff so i understand yeah. that dynamic also comes into play totally uh yeah there's there's sensitive people yeah. out there too that uh they yeah uh, don't like to see the fun sometimes because they interpret it a different way that you're lazy that you're slacking that you're not focusing on your patients or whatnot but um it's insane yeah. the I the comments that you you or I or really anybody receives sometimes on certain videos or posts or something. And you said this is a common thing in the United States between other people oh, that you communicate absolutely. with. Absolutely. I yeah, I have um many friends, influencers or not, that are in nursing just around America, um, in many different states. And every single one of them has had an issue with HR and the things that they are posting, which are not even bad. They don't break HIPAA. They don't, it's really nothing uh, significant, but HR, all, like they have all had a run in with HR about it. So, so now let's just say you establish this, you're somebody that's creating content and you talk to HR. Do you set a boundary where you don't record anything at work, even yeah. like your lunch? Like how does that work for you as far as trying to share the day in the life of an ER nurse, but you're very limited to what you yeah. can share? Yeah. So you have to be very careful. I don't do, I don't, um, like film anything or post anything unless it's on a break. Um, so it's not being paid for, um, uh, on top of that, I won't post on social media until the following day or even days after. Um, I never, when I talk about, so I, I do a lot of teaching. So anything that I post about, a story of mine or something that I've experienced is always turned into a, a teaching point. Mm. And so, for instance, if I were to post a quiz question on my Instagram about a real life patient that I had, I will obviously there's no patient identifiers. A lot of the times the age or the lab values or whatever in the question are skewed. Um, and I never post about it the same day that I had worked with that patient. So it'll be a week later, um, maybe two weeks later. You can never trace it back to anything that I've done or seen or taken care of. What are some advice you give to a nurse that's kind of had a, has had a run in with with ER or not ER with uh, HR? Um, how they should maybe advocate for themselves or maybe some tips you can give about yeah. like what they could do and what they can't do. I think one of the biggest things is to get your hospital policies. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the times the things that HR will get on you for are personal preference that they just personally don't like to see. 
and it has nothing to do with you violating anything or um, crossing any boundary because it's m m most of the time not even in a policy. Mm -hmm. It's really just personal preference. So what I usually suggest is to ask your hospital for their policies so that you can read through them and know that you are violating or not uh, violating something specific. And then you can also set the boundaries with them of, listen, this is what I do on the side. I love doing this, but I will not do it on your property or your paid work time or, you know, not in real time or whatever. Um, and then the third thing is to just be transparent. Like I said, for jobs that I've um, either interviewed for or when I was a travel nurse or whatever, uh, I will tell them upon hire, this is what I do on the side. Just so they're aware that they, you know, they don't get caught off guard like, whoa, I had no idea um, and kind of try and use that to their advantage. But yeah. And going back to R and explain, can you maybe offer some insight of how you kind of built that from like the, the back end standpoint for anybody out there that's kind of trying to maybe start something on their own? Um, did you start with like a website? How did how did, what were like the building blocks to R and explain become into what yeah. it is today? Yeah, so I didn't really have um, a plan. Mm. I still don't really have a plan. Um, I just kind of take it day by day. But what I found to be um, very successful was the type of content that you're putting out there. I think a lot of the times there are people that try to make it big or try to make this business and they will put out any type of content just to put it out there. And I don't think that's always good. I think that the content that you put out there has to be meaningful and purposeful. And um, if it's, you know, in medicine, factual. And yeah, I think that you should take time on what you're putting out there and not just throw all these, you know, things um, into social media. So I think that's a big one. Also being uh, consistent with um, whatever your goal is. So for me, I like to grow my audience because when I grow my audience, they're reaching my website. And then when they reach my website, they're buying my product. And so in order to do that, I need to be consistent with the videos that I'm posting. I try to post at least four to five times a week now um, just to keep my engagement high. And so I think that's really good. I don't even have a website of my own yet. Um, so I don't know how significant it is that you need a website, but you can, if you want to, to make it you more official. But I think really it's just the content you're putting out there to have a really good product and to just be consistent. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's crazy that you're saying that you don't even need a website. You're, you don't even know. And most yeah. people, when they start businesses, that's like the first thing they want to do by domain, make sure, making sure. So, yeah. again, I think it really comes down to community. And just like you said, the impact that you're bringing out and the value that you're putting out to your audience, mm -hmm. not necessarily trying to create 10 clips and post them because the algorithm is really good exactly. this week. And that's what you need to do. Yeah, exactly. I see a lot of people on social media do that. And I'm just like, ah, guys, yeah. you don't need to. Do you have any future plans with where you want to take your business? Anything that you're excited for? Some goals that you're striving for? Yeah, I just started YouTube. So I do like five minute kind of crash courses on um, YouTube. They're a little longer than my TikTok ones. So you get a little more info. Um, so I really want to try and grow that. I'm coming out with a couple more products this summer. Uh, some flashcards, like pharmacology flashcards, because that's like the hardest, you know, uh, course for students. So I'm going to come out with flashcards for that and a couple other products. And then I really just want to, I, I guess, just continue growing. Um, I do want to go back to school to either get my NP so I want to do that at some point. And yeah, it's exciting with your NP. What route are you thinking about like family or any specific one? Yeah. Mm. So to be NP in the ER, what I found is you have to do family FNP um, unless the school that you go to, but it's very rare. They have like an emergency. I don't even know what it's called. E ENP, maybe emergency nurse practitioner. Um, but that's kind of rare to find at a college. So the FNP route is probably what I'll do. Mm. Okay. And as a nurse and as a business person, how are you uh, balancing your schedule to prioritize and create self-care? I know that's a topic 
ever since the pandemic to prioritize yourself. So how are you doing that? Um, I work out. I yeah. <laughs> I have a trainer um, that so I dedicate a at least an hour to an hour and a half a day. Try I do four days a week um, to work out, and that is like my sanity. And then I uh, also hang out with my friends. I try to kind of shut off social media for a good amount of time. This year, I'm really trying to travel. I'm saying yes to everything. So I'm traveling and yeah. Yeah, Matt and I always preach uh, working out as like the go-to for like all oh self-care kind of go things. To. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Like you feel good. Like it sucks when you're there, you know, the weights can be heavy, the cardio kind of sucks, yeah. but afterwards you just feel so good and you see your body changing, improving. And it's like, you literally see the results of all the time you're, you're putting in on yourself. And it's always an amazing feeling. Yeah, I completely agree. It's so hard to get there, especially because you're tired. Like as a nurse, I just feel like you're exhausted. So getting there is the hardest part, but it has, it's become a part of my routine and it honestly keeps me sane. And Stephanie, one last question we'd like to ask all of our guests. If you had the opportunity to have a cup of coffee one last time with anybody, who would it be and why? What does one last time mean? Like, uh, do they have to be like living, not living, like... De dead or alive, yeah. There's... Ooh. Okay, if I could have a cup of coffee with anyone, one would probably be non-living my mom. That'd be awesome. If I could just uh, have a chat with her, that'd be cool. Uh, living Oprah. Oprah. <laughs> uh, why Oprah? As random as it is. I love Oprah. I don't know why. I, I have grown up watching her. I think it was three o'clock every day after school. I would watch Oprah and I love her. So oh, I don't know. I just think she's so wise and she's so like well-spoken and yeah. Yeah. Like maybe I think it's probably like your nursing, like your inner nurse calling because Oprah has always been seen as like this nurturing person having yeah. these having yeah. all these foundations these, these nonprofits, and she's a, uh, a woman in business too that's that's very you know yeah. su successful so that's like that's probably why you're getting pulled towards her she's she's like almost yeah. like your idol in a sense in a way yeah she is she is she's great she's awesome i yeah i've grown up watching her so i'm just like well oh, that'd be so cool to talk to her and stephanie where can people find you if they want to ask some questions reach out to you or maybe buy your products yeah. So, um, questions or reaching out to me, Instagram, I look through every single DM of mine. So at Stephanie Beggs on Instagram, um, TikTok, I do a lot of content on there as well. And that's at Steph Beg with no S at the end. Um, and then I have my Etsy shop, which is R and explained on Etsy. And that's where you can find all of my products too. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie, for being on the show and sharing your knowledge Thank you for doing yeah. what you're doing and helping student nurses and the future generation of nurses with everything you do with RN Explained. So good luck to you and maybe we'll see you again. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.